And welcome everyone um, on this uh, Tuesday afternoon. Uh, we're here in Washington. I personally am in Washington, D.C., but uh, a number of our uh, panelists are uh, all over. Um, so we'll meet them in a second, but I'm excited to welcome you to another one uh, of our webinars and conversations on an important topic, barriers to entry in government markets. Uh, we'll discuss the importance of this topic in a second, um, but uh, just to kind of set things off, I first want to uh, thank our sponsor, uh, Ivalia. Uh, some of you may know Ivalia as a as a e procurement platform um, that's uh, uh, really helping improve government procurement, um, as well as working with a lot of commercial clients. But in government, uh, working with the state of Maryland, uh, federal government of Canada, uh, Ohio. Uh, New York City, uh, but please check out their mm, uh, site at ivalio.com uh, and see all the great things they're doing. And thank you again to the iValio team. Uh, so let me just go ahead and jump in to the um, today's topic. Um, so today's topic, uh, as I mentioned, is a really important one, one we're uh, at Public Spend Forum uh, covering in great detail, and we're kicking off a global study, which we'll uh, mention briefly. Uh, but today's uh, topic, uh, like I said, what, the discussion that we'll focus on uh, are one, um, you know, from the perspective of our panelists today, who are a number of suppliers and, and uh, investment uh, firm, uh, understand what are the biggest barriers uh, for suppliers in government markets. Uh, so we're starting to uh, build on some themes there. Uh, really excited to hear what they have to say. Um, what are some tips for success? So what are we seeing out there in terms of solutions? Um, what tips do they have to offer both to government as well as to suppliers? Um, uh, um, so that'll inform the gist of the conversation and our audience, really, uh, it's a mix, right? It's, it's government programs. Uh, and I'm excited that government, you know, all the great people that we work with in government, they all want to know what the barriers are and what they can do to fix them. Um, and then, of course, um, uh, a lot of smaller companies, emerging companies, tech companies that are, uh, have great solutions and want to figure out how to serve the government market. So here we go. Um, so our panelists today, um, we've got uh, a great, great lineup. Um, so we really constructed this panel, you know, as I was thinking about it, really get the get the supplier view. You know, last last uh, conversation, if you recall, a couple of weeks back was more, uh, you know, it was some people from government uh, and, and uh, as well as experts. And we had a great conversation. So I expect that today as well. Um, but, you know, I'll stop talking here and maybe we can go in the order of uh, uh, this slide here and do introductions. And rather than me trying to do the intro, uh, I'll just go ahead and start off. Uh, Shelly, um, I'm not sure if Shelly's on yet. Shelly, I'm on. on. There you go, Shelly. Uh, Shelly, hey, tell hey. us where, where, you're, where you are this uh, today in which part of the country. And uh, just, uh, just to give a, you know, if you don't mind, just tell, tell us about yourself quickly. Raj, I'm sitting right next to you. You can't see me? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining. I'm actually uh, in San Francisco today. And um, in San Francisco, um, I work with the Shatter Fund, which I um, founded to invest in technology companies that are led and founded by female entrepreneurs. Uh, my background is heavily in government and technology. Um, I was in the Obama administration, the second Obama administration, on the President's Council for Women in Business. And so I'm very um, vested in and very passionate about bringing innovative companies to government. Great. And I've known Shelly for a long time, and she's been great, uh, you know, great to learn from. And uh, it's great to see all the great, um, you know, lots of awesome things she's doing out there and helping others. Um, and, uh, and, and Shelly introduced us to Gentry Lane. Gentry, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me here today, too. Great. Uh, Gentry, tell us a little bit about your, uh, you know, yourself and your company. Sure. I'm the CEO and founder of Nova Intelligence. We're a comp security company who works for national defense. Um, that means, in regular language, that we find um, the bad guys in your IT and OT networks using math. It's a really, really cool, innovative technology that I developed with Oak Ridge National Laboratory. So our solution was built by the government for the government. You would think it'd be really easy to get in and do business with the yeah. government with that pedigree, but it's not. And let's talk about that later. Yeah, that, that, that will be very interesting. 
Um, Sirnesh, uh, welcome back. And uh, I know uh, I've had a chance to uh, do a couple of events with Sirnesh. And where are you today? Uh, yeah, thanks, Raj. So I'm based in the Seattle area, which is where I am today. Um, not surprisingly, it's a rainy day in Seattle. Our summer seems to be over. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm responsible for business development, which in our, in my company's world today encompasses all of sales, marketing, partnerships, and true BD. Uh, this is a company called Studio 216. We build uh, an immersive XR platform for the enterprise with mostly functionality built around uh, training in immersive environments, as well as uh, this very interesting 360 panel based remote inspection tool. So it's like being at a facility without traveling to that facility. Uh, combined with a robotics platform. Uh, so yeah, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Great, great. Well, we could have maybe used that technology today for our webinar too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll set that up for next time. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, and we have uh, Spence Witten. Uh, hi, Spence. Spence is uh, never short of uh, providing some great commentary and, uh, and and provocative thinking. So I'm excited to hear from Spence today. Hi, Spence. Hi, Raj. I think that's just a polite way of saying I talk too much. So uh, as uh, Raj mentioned, my name is Spence Witten. I'm the Vice President of Global Sales at Lunar Line. Uh, following Studio 216, I am in Area Code 216, which is Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I, uh, I've got an interesting position in that my company is 50-50 federal and commercial and uh, with a good mix of both services and products. So I oversee sales on both sides. Um, my background is primarily federal, but uh, I've got about five years uh, in the commercial space too. So I have an interesting perspective, I think, on what the good, bad, and ugly on, uh, on both sides and how organizations can change hats between uh, private sector sales and federal sales in an effort to uh, enter these markets. Great, great. Um, yeah, I know, uh, and, and uh, we know Lunar Line well, and uh, they do a lot of really uh, great work. Um, so, um, so before we jump into the conversation, which I want to get to very quickly, I'm just going to do a couple slides, I uh, promise to be short, and uh, just to uh, set this up. Uh, first of all, if you're not familiar, um, let me see if I can actually go to the next slide. So actually, we did talk about iValia. Thank you again to our uh, sponsor. Um, and then uh, if you're not familiar, um, sorry, it looks like um, I might have clicked on something wrong. <laughs> All right, let me know if you see the right slides, everyone. Just see, we, yeah, you, there you go. Okay, there you go. Okay, so GovShop, uh, just quickly, if you don't know, uh, Public Spend Forum uh, has developed a platform just to address this very problem of barriers to entry. Um, uh, called GovShop, and it's a uh, place where uh, government can go and uh, hopefully easily find companies, including new and emerging companies, um, uh, on in one place. And 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 suppliers can also uh, really present what they do in a more meaningful manner uh, to government. Uh, so please check out GovShop.com if you don't if you haven't already. And then Public Spend Forum, you may know, uh, is a global platform for best practices. Uh, on um, public procurement and market intelligence uh, for public sector markets. Um, so uh, we're uh, based uh, out of Washington, but we also have offices in Chicago, London, and, and in Delhi. Um, so I think that kind of tells you um, some of the participating parties, but uh, just to set this topic up and jump into the conversation, uh, I, I shared these slides last time too. So uh, um, if you didn't know, government spent $10 trillion uh, on buying stuff, simply stated. Um, and then there's um, US government or US governments, that's local, state and federal, make up 2 trillion of that. So I know a lot of times we talk about the federal market. The federal market is actually only one quarter of the total US government spending uh, on, on procurement. I think we're gonna get into this conversation, but you know we've actually done a lot of research already into this area and had lots of conversations. Simply stated, we've categorized barriers into these five buckets, but you know that may completely change as we do more of these conversations and our research. Um, but you can see these, uh, everything from you know the very complex and onerous processes that we know to a lot of the legal requirements, policies uh, that are very difficult to understand sometimes, especially for newcomers. Um, just the culture of communication um, between buyers and suppliers, uh, what you can and can't do, and what some of the misperceptions are there. Um, 
some at least perceived incumbent supplier advantages that are maybe sometimes built into, you know, very complex statements of work, et cetera. And then one of the biggest things that bugs both government and companies is the speed of the overall process, how slow it is, which uh, not only hurts companies, but also government's ability to deliver. Um, so um, with that, let me just go ahead and jump in. Um, so we've had a chance to hear from everyone. Uh, the first question uh, everyone I have for you is, um, I know we could talk about barriers and uh, for a long time and we will, um, but in less than 30 seconds, could you tell us the single biggest hurdle um, you see, whether it's your company or as an investor, Shelley, what you've seen? Um, what's the single biggest hurdle uh, companies face in the government market? I would say as from an investor, so I've been on both sides of the equation as a supplier and now as, um, as an investor. And I say with the investor hat, um, especially the companies at the size and the stage that I deal with, um, seed stage companies looking to get into government, I think there's two things. Um, first of all, there is a, and there's a financial burden um, to work with the government in terms of um, just the cost that you have to take on, the, um, the, the responses that you have to give. So there's a financial aspect of it, which requires capital. The mm -hmm. other part of it, Raj, which has always been really um, interesting for me is the transparency. You know, where do the companies know where to go? How do they know where to go? What are the um, open, you know, what are the options and the availabilities in terms of contracting? So I think capital for those companies and then the ability to get in front of um, the right buyers. That's great. That's and, and we'll dig in and we'll go into that a little bit uh, in, a, in a couple of minutes, Shelly, but that was a great start. Uh, who would like to jump in? Um, Gentry? Do I would, you... yeah. yeah. Also, um, to add to that, there's a lack of continuity between administrations. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can start the selling process um, in one administration and then there's so much changeover, especially within the agencies as well. So um, you'll make a lot of really, really good progress for three or four or six months, and then boom, the whole department has changed or gone away. In, mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. my case, a lot of the cybersecurity um, departments have just gone. And um, it's uh, really hard to keep, there's a lot of bureaucratic inertia, rather. It's really hard to keep the momentum going. No, I, I think we can probably all relate to that. Um, uh, yeah, um, uh, Sir Nish? Yeah, I couldn't agree more with everything that's being said. I think also, uh, you know, I've, I've been part of larger organizations that uh, are able to spend a lot more resources in terms of uh, time, effort, money on pursuing government opportunities. But mm -hmm. being with a much smaller startup that's kind of at a seed stage now, I think it becomes a lot about return on effort, right? Mm -hmm. So how much effort are you, how much um, sales pursuit effort are you going to put behind a, a government type opportunity that has all the traits that your earlier slide outlined, as opposed to then saying, hey, this is not worth it. Let's chase after the private enterprise side because, you know, and interestingly enough, on, even on the private enterprise side, they have a lot of the same requirements, especially when it comes to uh, security, et cetera. Uh, but it's just a more, you know, it's more tangible results there with more predictability. Um, on sales cycles and things of that nature. So it, sometimes for smaller organizations, it ends up being a matter of, not, a, not so much a matter of that the public sector is not of interest, it definitely is, but it's more, hey, where do we marshal our resources which are limited and what do we chase after? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, and, and, and Spence? Yeah, so to, to add on there, I think that um, you know one of the biggest uh, barriers that I've noticed for small businesses with innovative solutions. So, I mean, let's say you're a venture back, uh, small company, maybe just past the seed stage with uh, a marketable technology. That's really cool. That has potential to make a big difference in how organizations operate. You're probably in the venture back world, initially operating with commercial customers, smaller projects, smaller dollar value, more of them. And then you find yourself wanting to go into federal and you learn that from a cultural perspective, the sales team culture, the, the structure of your sales team, how you approach marketing, how you talk about your products, the various different things you have to consider, the sales cycles themselves are all radically different. It is really difficult, and I, and I deal with this on a daily basis with my own teams, it's really difficult to get a commercial-focused sales team, those talents, those skills, that mindset, that approach, and adapt it to federal and vice versa. And so I see a lot of companies really, like, 
they, they, they beat their heads against the wall for two years, three years against these long federal sales cycles, adopting sales techniques that would be perfectly effective in the commercial space using individuals who are extremely skilled in the commercial space. And then they get frustrated that they're not making having success in the federal space. And it's very difficult to find teams and individuals that can swap hats really quickly. Um, I think throughout this presentation, I can share some tips and ideas to find those team members, train those team members and be effective in both spaces. Yeah, no, I think I think that would be great. Um, um, maybe maybe we can start there because I, I definitely have follow ups on all and and uh, like I like we discussed before we started this call. Please all, uh, I hope we can all kind of uh, jump in here without me prompting. Uh, but maybe I can start that off. Uh, uh, Spence, um, do you what are what are some tips in terms of okay? So if it's difficult to adapt, um, kind of the commercial sales uh, approach into government. And that skill set. What skill sets? What what are those tips there? Then? Well, I think one of the great. So, if if for the attendees in the audience, if you're not following Raj on LinkedIn, I uh, highly recommend that you you know you go connect with him now because um, you know I think Raj, you illustrated it yourself on uh, on Labor Day there. Um, you know, you you've been you know promoting a uh, wonderful product and service to the federal space, and then all of a sudden you got hit with these giant requirements, these giant proposals. Um, all these different hoops you have to, uh, to jump through the, to enter the government market. And a lot of times with, when we face a federal procurement, we're inevitably square pegging round holding what we have versus what the government wrote up as a requirement. Because ultimately, I have to check the box on every single federal requirement to clear the procurement hurdles to even be able to be considered as a, as a viable solution. And so mm -hmm. the sales structure on the commercial side is a lot different. And so I think my, my advice to federal customers who are looking at solutions that have great play in the private sector space um, is to, you know, understand that when, when we sell in the private sector, it tends to be an iterative open discussion um, that frankly, I love, like, you know, a decision maker calls us up, lays out, you know, maybe an issue with a current supplier or a very specific technical challenge they're having. And we have a running conversation over several phone calls, several orals, maybe product demos, maybe service case studies where we, iteratively develop that requirement set and then ultimately, you know, compete on that. And that's very difficult to do in the public space because, you know, whether they're correct or whether they're not, you know, whether it's the right read of the FAR or not, you know, contracting officers and decision makers have a difficult time having that kind of rolling conversation with vendors um, because they feel like they're going to run afoul of procurement policies. And so I think for, if, for the federal buyers in the line and the state and local buyers in the line, if you're dealing with an organization that has a great product, but their sales structure seems off and it seems like they want to talk more, if they want to do more oral presentations, if they want to help you develop requirements, don't get turned off by that. I mean, that's just how we roll in the private sector. Um, and so I see like so many promising solutions where contracting officers decide that a private sector company is trying to be corrupt simply because they want to help shape the requirement. <laughs> Whereas, like that's kind of a no-no in the federal space. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, I wonder uh, if anybody wants to chime in on any of what uh, Spence has said, or we can kind of continue down some of the other things we just mentioned. For us, it's been, um, this is Gentry here, it's been really essential to have an advocate within the agency to help push things through, because it's just, you know, there's so much going on. It's really hard um, once you get to the procurement office state to not get lost in the shuffle. Oh, uh, yeah. But to tack on to what Spence was saying about, you know, the sales um, skill sets that you need or the kind of people that you need on the team to pursue public sector opportunities as opposed to commercial. That's very well said as well. And I think that, uh, you know, it, especially when you're a seed stage company or a smaller outfit, uh, folks like myself or Spence, I'm sure will end up wearing multiple hats. So we lead those kind of efforts till it becomes a sustainable business. Uh, and I think, you know, I'd love Shelly's perspective on this as an investor as well. Sometimes it's also about the internal messaging to management and investors to say, look, this is a different kind of market. So don't have the same expectations or return here. Um, there's going to be longer sales cycles. There's going to be special skills we need to build up. If you really are serious about pursuing this, don't just do it for two months and say, oh, this is not moving as fast as we'd like. So let's just drop it. And that's a good point. And I think fortunately, you know, venture and investment is a long-term play as it is. And in some ways it's kind of matched um, to the government cycle. Um, you know, we don't expect returns. Um, you know, the life of a fund is generally 10, 10 years and, you know, no one expects returns on a seed stage company. Um, I would say generally people don't expect that. Um, 
you know, within the next two year or two years. And so it's okay to invest and expect a longer term sales cycle with government. I think um, what's really interesting is that the, the technologies that government needs ultimately drive um, efficiencies for the constituents. And I, I think that that is where my own um, passion would be to bring these companies um, into government because it can just be better, right? The returns are there for the customers and customers are your constituents. Great. Yeah. And, and um, you know, I think, I think both uh, as you, as you talk about this, I think what we've seen is there's that motivation um, because, you know, uh, especially when you're entrepreneurs or seed stage companies uh, to give back in some way or see that your solution can somehow help. I'm just curious there then, you know, how, um, you know, I think Shelly, you mentioned upfront financial burden and, uh, you know, I think Sarnish, you mentioned return on effort, um, all of those things. How do you justify though? Um, you know, what's the, you know, maybe we can talk about that first. Like, how do you justify the case for, you know, these long sales cycles and a return on effort? Um, what's, what's the, what's, what's, is there a recipe there or, um, you know, some specific things that, you know, that are helpful when you go talk to investors or your internal management team? This is Sarnesh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll jump in. So I think a lot of it is, is around the attractiveness of the public sector market that I think, you know, fairly common traits for people saying, hey, mm -hmm. there's so much money being spent by the public sector. Um, the expectation, or at least the impression is, these are usually customers that will stay with you for the long term once you've sold them a solution. Uh, there's obviously a sense of pride as well for American companies selling to the public sector and saying, hey, we're part of this, this institution, the institutions that make up our, our country, right? So there's there's all there's a mix of all of those. Um, and, and like I was saying earlier, it's about the internal messaging from sales and marketing leaders uh, internally to management and investors for companies like ours, uh, kind of laying that out in context of the landscape of the market that we are selling into. So talking about commercial, talking about the partners mm -hmm. that we've gone through, mm -hmm. and then talk, adding the adding the public sector to that mix as well. Great. Um, yeah, I think, so to me, less the challenge is investment, Raj is expense, and um, and more on the management side. So like. If you look, uh, you know, I study every cybersecurity company because um, we're in the cybersecurity field too. And so every company that goes public, I mean, I tear apart their SEC filings just to kind of see what they've got going on under the hood. And um, you'll see things, you know, like, uh, you know, CrowdStrike's a great example where they're spending an enormous multiple on, of revenue on sales and marketing. Um, and so investors have, I, I, and in, in my own experience with the venture community, they have a great appetite or understanding of the need to, you know, spend money to make money. Where I think there's a management challenge is on, you know, it's, it's very difficult to manage a federal sales, sales team quarterly. Um, you know, you'll easily, you know, a great, you could have a wonderful year where you won one project in the fourth quarter. Um, and I think that's a mindset for, so if there's any, you know, commercially oriented sales managers on the line, that's a mindset that you have to adapt and you have to adjust your KPIs to meet, sorry, your key performance indicators to um, adapt to the federal sales world. You have to adapt your, you know, your, quarterly revenue expectations. And so to me, it's always been more of a challenge of communicating to management what those expectations are and how to measure success in those long cycles than it is um, uh, talking to investors who tend to get it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So be prepared for some difficult conversations if you're a commercially focused organization and you're trying to retool your sales team for federal because, you know, it's going it, it, to, it's difficult to show quarterly progress. Yeah, no, uh, that's a really good point. I think, um, and and that's why how we typically set targets, right? I'm guilty of some. So, actually, actually, I'd like to jump in real quick, um, Raj. You know, one of the things you know that you've done so well, and you're continuing to disrupt the procurement process and bringing suppliers and buyers together and transparency. Um, but shouldn't you know we we continue to talk about the long sales cycle? That is exactly the problem. That is exactly what we need to disrupt. And at that point. Um, I believe the D, um, D I U X, right? Is that, isn't that out of San Francisco mm -hmm. and then out of Texas? They were, that's exactly what they were aiming to do. Um, they were putting out, you know, quick requests for proposals and within 30 days they were able to um, select from responses and then grant 
uh, the contract or, you know, whatever it might be that they were giving um, to the company that they were looking for. So they, there are efforts, and I think our focus also should be on how can we shorten that sales cycle? How realistic do you think that is? Yeah, you know, good thing is, um, if, if many of you are following, I think some, some of you are, um, you know, um, I think DIUX is a great example. In addition to that, there's been a lot of these, um, you know, innovative methods that have been set up, uh, like, uh, other transaction authorities and others where a lot more challenges and competitions and other things, the Air Force just through Kessel Run, you know, where they're kind of built a world-class software development arm. You know, they awarded, um, you know, some hundred odd con uh, contracts within hours. And, and, and uh, so, um, so, so I think, Shelly, good thing is we're seeing a lot more of that. And uh, I think the key other thing is, though, how do we also change within the procurement process? So that's somewhat outside of the traditional procurement process. So, uh, so what we're trying to now figure out is also how do you hack the traditional process, but there is a lot of movement in that direction. Uh, sounds like somebody was trying to add something there. Yeah, this is Gentry. I just wanted to say also that NSF had a, has a great new initiative where they're um, um, fast tracking uh, grant applications. So you fill mm -hmm. out a really fairly minimal, I, I don't know if I'll, any of you have ever applied for federal grants before, but it's a really painstaking long process, but um, the NSF new program is just, it's wonderful. So when these innovation prog programs are coming out, the new recent ones that have happened, I think they're working really well. The question yeah. is how, how to get all agencies on board with this new method. And I think that's one of the things I, I think, Shell, uh, sorry, uh, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to add on to that saying that, you know, that that's really the crux of the matter, right? So when you think about uh, responding to an RFP at a state level or, or whatever entity that you're, you're um, trying to do business with, uh, it seems like it's so completely fragmented. So it's great that there's these innovative groups that are saying, hey, let's do something interesting uh, with a different way of doing procurement. But really, I guess, and I guess maybe Raj, this is a question, more, more a question for you than anything else. But wouldn't it be phenomenal to see a common set of standards adopted across all these public entities? And I understand that there'll be, you know, certain entities that are, uh, let's say, more relaxed about cybersecurity type standards or, or security type standards, depending on what you're selling into. Obviously, you know, Department of Defense will have much higher requirements on that side than, let's say, a, a, a state level entity. But do you think that's that's even possible to, to be able to have, uh, have, all, have the entire set of public sector entities adopt common procurement standards? Because that would make life a lot easier, wouldn't it? Yeah, um, and I think that's really a great, great vision to have. Um, again, I think that there are a number of things going on that give me hope uh, more so. I think a lot of people hope. Uh, if you're following, um, I would encourage everyone to, for instance, check out the Defense Entrepreneurs Forum and what's happening there. Right? The Defense Entrepreneurs Forum, uh, in collaboration with really lots of government OTAs, et cetera, there, it's, it's a very disruptive process right now. And, and part of what they are trying to do is one, create more and more examples, lots, lots of them. And then two, there is a movement afoot towards, you know, cataloging and trying to start to at least first say which ones are working and then we can work towards hopefully some level of standards. Uh, I think Sunish, like, you know, this is like the Titanic, right? If you're talking federal, but even state local you know, trying to get everybody to work together. It's, it's, it's going to take a lot of work. So I think the, to me, from my perspective, I'm curious if anybody else has a different perspective on that. But I think the way it's starting organically and grassroots across the board is actually the way to do it. And it's gaining a lot of momentum uh, just even the past year and a half. And I think DIUX and others uh, you know, set the stage, but uh, in many ways, uh, some other organizations have already surpassed what they're doing. I think it's always think it's a good idea to outsource um, innovation sourcing <laughs> uh, to the private sector. It's a little bit of an unrealistic expectation for the government to be the, the center and expert on innovation. I think the more people in, in the private sector take take on that matchmaking role, the better for everybody. What I'd love to see, and it kind of goes back to something Gentry said earlier about, um, 
you know, how difficult it's like we have federally, you know, technology that came out apart with federal sponsorship. And, uh, but it's still challenging for Gentry and our company to get those solutions implemented in the government. We, we need like a big, a big part of the battle is just getting those initial past performances in the federal space. And it's almost mm-hmm. like we need a broader, so like the OTAs are, are great. The IUX is great. I, I haven't seen those uh, expanded to the extent I would like, because what we need is technology like Gentry's in, you know, a number of different civilian agencies, even just little footholds. I mean, we don't need massive, you know, hundred million dollar contracts. So I'm sure Nova wouldn't complain about that. It's, mm-hmm. But they do need a chance. They, they need a, you know, a chance to do a test project. And the government is uniquely suited to take those kinds of risks. It's nothing for the government to spend, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars on an innovative idea, put it in a lab and test it. It's, it's really not. I mean, it's, it's, it's a tiny fraction of a budget. Um, it's not really it's not a, a major risk to operations to do those kind of test projects and give companies like that a chance. But the government seems uh, uniquely uh, hesitant to take that step. And I've never quite understood. I mean, I, I understand it because I'm involved in government, but I never really understood the math behind that. I mean, you know, I think HHS should take a chance on, on Gentry and her company and, you know, yeah, spend hundred thousand dollars on a, on a, on a test pilot case. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. But if, if it does work out, you know, now Nova has that little foothold to really build upon within an agency and grow upon with the federal government. I mean, we, we need federal buyers to be willing to take those chances and to set up procurement tracks that empower those decision makers to take those chances. I think, Spence, only only thing I would say, I think, is uh, you're seeing more examples, like what just the IRS just set up, for instance. I forget the exact name, if we could look it up on our team and post it. But, you know, they set up exactly that. The process is, you know, they set up through, in collaboration with procurement and CIO, a vehicle where everything has to go through a three-stage process. The first one is only $25,000, and it's prototype development. And it's going to be done really quickly, and the prototype has to develop in X number of days. And then, you know, after that, they award, I forget, $100,000 or some number. And then it's only for another 30 to 60 days uh, from the down select from that. So um, you are seeing more. And I, I'm actually surprised by the rapid clip of those that's happening. And I think one of the things we're trying to do on Public Spend Forum is, and through other channels, you know, all the other uh, organizations that are really making great strides um, is highlight those examples so more people are aware and uh, and more of government is doing those things. So there is more and more of that. I think it's still obviously we can tell there's not broad awareness. So that's uh, that's a big opportunity still. Um, let me let me just go ahead and if you don't mind if we could switch um, um, to like actually Brent uh, from the White House is on. Uh, hi Brent. Uh, he just, uh, uh, by the way, just posted something on chat um, where, um, you know, an, uh, an example of a procurement experiment at a civilian agency, uh, co-designed procurement. So we'll post that. Um, I think there, uh, you know, uh, Brent and others, I think there's, there's so many great examples right now. So we'll go ahead and post a number of these. So I think we continue to build awareness. Let me just ask you all and switch gears a little bit and say, you know, it is what it is, right? Like right now, I think we've talked about some of the challenges and also some of the things that are happening that hopefully are starting to change the tide a little bit, at least starting that. But in spite of all of that, what are the solutions? Could you talk a little bit about, you know, what solutions? Uh, Shelly, maybe we could start with you. Um, you know, what are the things then when you're advising companies or companies in your portfolio, uh, what are you seeing uh, the steps they are taking to win business? Uh, in spite of some of the challenges we've discussed? Well, that, that's good. Thanks, Raj, for the question. I would say that, you know, regardless, is it public sector or private sector, what I always advise the companies that I'm working with, you know, what I've learned from my mentors is, you know, why you? What's your differentiator? Why now? Why should they open up their wallets and give you money? What's the value you're bringing them? And how are you going to convince them? Those are the three things that I... Um, that I ask my companies to think about when they're talking to any entity, whether it's a MasterCard, whether it's um, whether it's an a- the DHS, whoever it is, and then from there, once you've differentiated and why you know why it should be you, then you have to be. I guess for me, the biggest thing is to go in um, through your relationships. I think in all sales, relationships are key. I agree. I think what Gentry was saying, having an internal champion or someone who's going to guide you through the uh, internal process. 
Um, but in addition, I, I believe that you have to start um, at the top. You have to come in recommended. You have to have someone who's going to bring you in as a warm introduction and who's going to um, – and who's, who's really going to walk you through the process because those references right off the bat make a lot of, they make a difference. Now, circling back to the public sector, I think they carry even more weight uh, mm-hmm. in terms of um, how a company is introduced, um, what their differentiators are, what edge do they have, and why they should be um, as part of the, you know, and part of the sales cycle and why they should be considered. Yeah, and to add on that, the good news is that a lot of the um, really higher ups in the federal government are very accessible <clears throat> here, here in DC. My strategy has always been to cyber or to stalk people at um, conferences mm-hmm. <laughs> and meet them afterwards with my um, you know, 30 second elevator pitch and say, this is exactly what we do. Here's how we do it. How can we talk about it further? And it, it's worked. I've really gotten um, you know, meetings with directors of agencies that way. So, um, Gentry, if I could ask further on that. Uh, so I think, I think, you know, a lot of people approach a lot of people, let's just say at these conferences and events. And, um, you know, I think, I think we've heard the opposite side of that as well, you know, uh, where people never get a call back or never get a meeting. Uh, what do you think is a secret there that, you know, you're obviously doing something right. Uh, and, and, uh, so what's, what's the secret in, uh, in terms of, you know, why does your message resonate, you think, and, and how you get that next step? Well, it's, it's what Shelly said. It's why me, why now, why this company? Um, the product market fit has to be perfect. Otherwise, it's just disrespectful. You're wasting somebody else's time, um, especially these leaders who, you know, are, or for me, I work in with Defense Department. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, they've got they're saving our country. They're protecting our democracy. So you really have to have um, a compelling case before you before you approach and make an ask. Um, go ahead. Can I? Can I? Sorry, I was going to say I was going to ask. Not yeah. You do have a have, have to have a compelling case. You have to know your audience. I think also that you know you when you are pitching someone. You're, you're, whether it's an email, your 30 second pitch, whatever it is, it has to convey the value. How are you a fit for them? And that will resonate. Now, give me an example. Um, I don't know if uh, you know, Raj, that I'm actually an advisor to Gentry's company. And um, how Gentry and I met is she cold emailed me. So um, the first couple of times I did not have a chance to respond, but I remember thinking that, you know, this is something I want to learn about. But really what resonated with me was, the message and the, um, and the, and I, I guess the, what she was putting forward, she came across as very confident. Look, I know the value I bring here um, is our technology. Here's how I think I'm a fit for you and the shatter fund. And I just need about five minutes to explain it. And I, and I wanted to do that. And, and since then we've started working together. So I think that how you execute your message really makes a difference. And uh, so my perspective is a little different on that one. I, um, you know, I, it's fun to meet with senior people, right? It's fun to meet with the folks that, uh, you know, headline conferences. But this is one of the challenges in sales and government is that for the most part, they don't spend money. Um, so where the people who, who spend money and control budgets are down a layer. I mean, so when I'm working with the Department of Defense, I don't, you know, I mean, it's fun to meet with a two-star and, you know, we'll take that meeting. But, I mean, that, that uh, two-star is moving on in, in a couple of months to a new command or retiring. And what I need is the person in the skiff who never puts their head up and um, actually controls the budget. And so that's a major, for my commercial sales teams that are crossing over to federal, that's a major culture change because they're used to being able to go top and go down. And in government, you, it's really difficult to find and identify the individuals who actually control budget and spending. Um, and I don't, I, I don't get it at conferences. Some people can. So if, uh, you know, Gentry's having success there, you know, by all means, like that's, you know, please continue. I've never had luck with that. Um, for me, it's about finding, warming in uh, on the ground in an agency, getting a badge and putting my ear down and figuring out where money actually flows, who's actually spending the money and, uh, and getting to know them, um, and positioning that way is, is the real, real objective. I wish it would work top down because it's easier to find those people, but I've never had luck with that. No, I mean, you know, you're 
I'm sorry. sorry I was going to say, is that, is, sorry, sorry. We, we both have something to say clearly. Spence, I think that, you know, I think that you're right as well, but I think it's a, it's a two pronged approach. You do have to go top down and bottom up or middle up or whatever you want to call it. You know, my question becomes the person who's controlling the budget is that the person ultimately making the decision? And that's not always the case. So you do have to know both of them. And I think how you're introduced into the deal does make a difference. And with that, I'll let um, Gentry, Gentry, go ahead, please. No, as I say, you're a thousand percent right. You're only half prepared if you're just meeting with just the head person and just thinking that they're going to write you a check or, you know, say, okay, go. Um, no, that's just, that's just your foot in the door. And it's a good foot in the door. Um, maybe because uh, my thing is sort of surveillance. Um, I'm pretty good. Or I just would advise everybody to put a lot of effort into um, figuring out um, how, the, how the departments are structured and who actually does what. Yeah, no, this is a, a, I think this is a really good part of the conversation here, not that others weren't. <laughs> um, but I, I think somebody said early on one of the barriers, right? I, I think like, I think, Shelly, you might have said it um, right up front. You know, who do you talk to? Where do you go, right? And, and we hear that a lot from companies. And I think, I think, and combined with Spence's point about, you know, federal versus commercial is different in terms of sales. And uh, so I think a lot of really good points here, but, but knowing, you know, the agency, knowing where the money's spent, knowing who the leaders are, who the decision makers are, there is a bit of work. And I think, I think like, so I'm just curious, let me ask you that, you know, I think these are all very valid points, but again, I am a entrepreneur, let's say, you know, I've got a zillion things to do and do. I'm sure all of you can relate. Right. And, and, um, you know, uh, I don't have time to do all of this. Or I guess let me ask it a, a, or say it a different way. Uh, ask you, how do you, you know, how do you even uncover all of this, right? Like what you just said, like it sounds easier than, uh, you know, stated, let's just say. Um, where do you start? Yeah, it's a lot of research. Um, I agree. It's just, you just have to start anywhere. Wherever you can get your foot in the door, start there. Um, there are high level conferences, low level conferences, there's industry days, there's lots of ways just to make a friend in the agency to figure out how to help me get closer to my, my goal person, my target rather. Um, yeah, it's not, it's not easy. It's very time consuming. I moved my, co my company across the country. I moved here to Washington DC just to be close um, just to have more opportunities to run into people and network people. And, you know, I really have made deals because I've cornered people in the elevator. Um, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, right place, right time. Great. Um, it me that, that a lot of what, uh, you know, what's interesting to me, and, and again, in past lives, I've been in front of fairly large procurements with the public sector, especially sensitive stuff with the DOD, et cetera. And, and what, what strikes me as interesting about some of the points in this conversation are that you could be talking about commercial sales and all these points would apply mm -hmm. as well, right? Um, so in some respects, the sales disciplines are, are, are effectively the same, uh, except you've got to understand the kind of market that you're dealing with, that there will be longer cycles, et cetera. Um, I think it's very interesting for me to hear because I, I, uh, I fall more on Spencer's side in terms of yeah, you can go and meet a leader in an organization, but then you have to know the middle management that's responsible for executing on procurement and deployment. Um, so it's interesting for me to hear that the top-down approach can work with the public sector as well. And I think the other thing is, um, you know, when you think about, Raj, to your point about, hey, you're an entrepreneur, you've got a thousand things to do, and this might be painfully obvious, but one of the things that's very helpful is to have some way of organizing all information that you uh, used especially when responding to an RFP, let's say, uh, in the past to, to public sector clients, really well organized and handy, because I find often the pain of pursuing a, a public sector opportunity often becomes uh, folks in leadership or folks in management saying, well, I don't know where to go to get all this information, or you know, can somebody please take this off of my hands, if you will, and I guess that falls to someone like me in my organization, but uh, it, it's helpful for the team internally to be very clear about what what kind of information do public sector buyers look for and what have we provided in the past and not have to kind of reinvent that every time there's a new pursuit in the public side. 
And, and Raj, I mean, I know it's a curse word for a lot of entrepreneurs, and I, and I understand that, but I think focus is especially important in the federal sector. So mm -hmm. I, I find that the, the organizations and the subcomponents of those organizations all have, I mean, like even something as simple as, you know, the authority that contracting officers have. I mean, that differs from, say, Federal Aviation Administration and FDIC that sort of can play by their own rules to something like, DO, you know, a, a command or a specific base of DOD that has, you know, very strict rules. And you really have to know the ins and outs there. And I think that's really, um, on the sales management side, that's really difficult to explain up to management too. It's like, no, like just because, D you, you know, we want a DHS project, but that doesn't mean DOD cares. And you're certainly not going to be able to carry that over to CIA. And HHS is a totally different animal. And so as for, for suppliers, as you're really thinking about government, I mean, think about one or two agencies only where you really think you have a compelling message and really go after those rather than try to gather everything. And I, I, whereas I find in the private sector, we can take a broader approach. I mean, I can sell to, um, you know, the power generation industry and I can sell to them pretty broadly because a lot of those organizations are kind of structured the same. Um, you know, they tend to have uh, pretty predictable processes and compliance requirements across various different organizations. So focus is especially important for entrepreneurs trying to break into to go. 100% agree with that. So Spence, can I drill down on that a little bit? Would you say that it's focus on the agency you're going after, focus on, you know, to stay with the one service you're providing? Like, you know, can you just go a little bit more into detail? I think that'd be very helpful for entrepreneurs to understand that that are on the call. Sure. So it's, it's kind of both. I mean, but with, with specific to, you know, the, on the sales, non-technical side and the sales side, um, I mean, I'm, I'm uh, you know, focused on, you know, very specific agencies because even within, you know, agencies are big. I mean, so HHS is a great, mm -hmm. Health and Human Services is a great one to pick on because, you know, you got Center mm -hmm. for Medicaid and Medicare Services, you have NIH, you have, um, you know, various different subcomponents under, I mean, it's a massive beast. And, um, focusing, and you have headquarters too, right? Headquarters is a different animal than the subcomponents. And, you know, Department of Energy is kind of the same way. I mean, there's, you know, the labs that are super independent and there's the National Nuclear Security Administration that has its own operating requirements. And, you know, you, you really, it takes a long time. And frankly, it takes a lot of money too. I mean, you can't, I, I, I've never, um, I mean, Gentry's starting to sound like a federal sales uh, genius because I, I, I've always had to work through other people. So if I want to get access to Federal Aviation Administration, I have to, you know, I focus on recruiting program managers out of that environment. I focus on recruiting BD people who've spent their entire careers there. I focus on hiring outside consultants that had senior positions to try to piece all the different pieces together. Um, and that's a lot of money. So it's not just time. I mean, that's a a significant investiture of, um, of resources. And I can't necessarily expect the team that I built to do that to immediately switch gears and go chase intelligence community work. Um, and so it's not, it's, it's both time and money. And um, it also is technical. I mean, you can't like one of the, I, I really hate about federal buying is how diversified it is. I and mean, we tend to bias against diversified IT services contractors. I mean, that's where a ton of the money goes, which is a disappointment because I think it tends to exclude niche specialists, but as a, as a small business, being a niche specialist in the federal space can be can be effective. Um, and so stay, stay focused. And that's always the hardest thing I see for people that are trying to dip their toe into federal is because it's this big thing. And they're like, wow, we can do it all. And, you know, it doesn't quite work out that way. Understood. Thank yeah, you. Agreed. Agreed. I think I think uh, I'm, I'm I feel like we can assemble an all-star team with this lineup here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, let me just say, uh, in the interest of time, uh, I know that there's a, there's a lot of really good advice here, by the way. So um, I think free advice for a lot of a lot of entrepreneurs here. Um, maybe we can also provide some advice for government. Um, you know, a lot of uh, uh, like I said, uh, there's a lot of really uh, government professionals that are looking to help and figure out what they can do, whatever's in their control, right? So if, you've, if you're a regular, uh, you know, if you're a contracting officer, uh, you know, who doesn't necessarily pull the policy uh, kind of uh, levers, let's say, and, and uh, doesn't have that control, and there are thousands of them working hard every day, right? So what's your advice to them? Uh, I'm just curious in terms of, uh, you know, what can they do? That would help, um, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, new companies, small businesses, others. Um, what's your uh, tangible advice to them? 
You mean on bringing in new companies, Raj? Like to yeah, like how uh, can they make the procurement? Yeah, how can they make the procurement process easier? Like, what about the procurement process? Could they? What's one or two things they could change that would make, say, it easier for smaller companies to compete? Okay, so I'll start with that. So you know, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go for it. Uh, I was going to say thank you. I was going to say you know, first off, you know, be specific. When a, you know, when a when an entrepreneur or when a small company is calling you, um, and you like you either do control the budget or you have information or you can be helpful, don't point them to the website and say, oh, you can do this and go find it on the website. Don't do that. Give them specifics. Tell them where they can go, what they can do, what they need to access, exactly who they need to approach. You know, bring transparency to the process. Give them next steps that are tangible. And mm -hmm. don't just, for God's sake, point them back to the website. I've seen it. I've experienced it. And I think that's probably more frustrating than anything where you actually get someone live and then mm -hmm. they just tell you to go back to where you came from. <laughs> No, that's a really good point. Yeah, it's so true. And I just got the most gruff um, email back from, uh, from the Air Force. And it was wonderful because I was following up on something and they just wrote me back and said, we got it. You'll hear from it. We're interested. You'll hear from us in anywhere between three weeks to three months. And then boom. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, that's what I was going to say is I think communication is key. Even if you don't have an update at a committed second time, say that, right? Like mm -hmm. reach out to the supplier and say, hey, we don't have an update yet. I mean, even that's valuable to uh, companies like ours that are that are just hungry for information on where the deal might be. Even that's a useful Yeah, thing. yeah. I, so I was suspense. So I think um, the biggest thing I always like to push across to federal buyers is that rules and structure create winners. And so like a, a sports example, you know, pass interference rules in football can make football can make uh, quarterbacks look amazing, right? And um, you know, it makes a very pass-friendly game. And so, when we pile on structure and we pile on rules, we bias the game towards people who know how to play the game by those rules. So, a, a wonderful example, a very concrete example, are the best-in-class contract vehicles. Um, I, I really hate the BICs. So, um, and I, I really, it's to me one of the biggest travesties in federal procurement that so much money and so much focus is, is traveling towards the BICs because they were structured in such a way, and I, I didn't actually didn't mind the structure, but they were structured in such a way to favor very specific types of providers. And so it's no, it's no mystery why the usual GovCon suspects won those contracts. And now we have so much money and so much focus flowing towards those, but you can't be a innovative contractor. You can't really even be a company that's got your feet in both fields in, you know, commercial and in federal and expect to win a place on the BIC. So when you structure your procurement program towards those best in class contract vehicles, you've already decided who you want to win. And I don't think enough federal buyers have that understanding that when you, the way you structure something and the rules you put in place, that in a lot of times are arbitrary. They aren't really tied to the FAR. They aren't really requirements in structuring things in that way and creating that rule set, you have created the winners. You've decided what group of companies are going to win. And it's probably not the Innovas in the world who are doing really interesting stuff. It's, you know, probably the diversified GovCon because that's who wins a spot on those vehicles. Yep. I, yep that's, a, that's a really good point. And, you know, again, you know, back to advice for these folks is that, you know, if it doesn't say in the FAR that you can't, you know, the FAR is not the, you know, it is open to interpretation is what I'm saying. So if it doesn't say you can't do something, it does mean that there is an opportunity to do something. So um, just, just interpret the FAR openly and correctly, I would say, and don't go for it word by word. Read between the lines a little bit. No, great stuff, and uh, I think that there's a lot of, a lot here to unpack. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. One thing I would say, I think, is just uh, unburden the requirements. Don't make them so specific that you know you basically have ruled out most companies. So uh, if we're really hiring companies for expertise, uh, give them the problem and let them offer advice on how to best solve it. Um, so. Um, what I can say, uh, everyone, is uh, hopefully I think we're seeing some progress, obviously slow progress, um, but, but uh, you know, there are things happening. Uh, any, any last words on, on, on uh, you know, for, for everyone here uh, on this topic? And as I said, you know, I'd, uh, this is just the start of the conversation, so I'm sure I'll be asking you to come back. But what do you, what do you, any, any last words of advice or input? 
everyone's uh, don't stop. Yeah. just and don't give up I, I would say don't raj give don't give up right yeah, yeah don't give up don't stop keep going i mean when i first started my first company back in 2008 i met with these two folks at this big company i was really excited because mm-hmm. I thought I was going to go in and do a subcontracting opportunity. And they sat me down and told me every reason why I should not go after government contracts. If the market is saturated. I was wasting my time and I should just shut down shop and go away. If I listened to them, I wouldn't be where I'm doing what I'm now. So just keep going no matter what. Yeah, that's well said. And I think it's also, uh, it is very encouraging to see some of these new innovative approaches being taken um, by players in the public sector. So that's, that's a, that's a very hopeful sign as well. And, you know, so looking forward to more of that. Yeah, and support these matchmaking efforts, support these bridges between um, government and private sector. Great. And uh, I, I think you all are, uh, you offered, I, I feel like we, we should have charged for this webinar. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all, the, all the free advice you've given. Uh, but thank you so much. Uh, I just want to let everyone know that, um, let me just kind of flip a couple slides if you don't mind. Um, you know, this, this um, study that we've kicked off, we're actually finalizing the survey and we have a few advisors giving us advice on uh, looking at the survey. Um, but, uh, you know, if you'd like to get involved, let us know. Um, this is really meant to be a global initiative and because we see governments around the world are struggling with this. And uh, it's an important uh, policy imperative for most governments uh, because not only you know, are we talking about government procurement, but we're also talking about entrepreneurship, innovation. You can actually help your economy if you do this right. Um, so, and create jobs. Um, so there's a whole lot at stake here. So uh, I appreciate everyone kind of uh, taking the time and, and, and uh, you know, spending time with us to share their advice and uh, and, uh, and we'll continue kind of on this path of really looking into these topics. So um, thank you everyone um, uh, again. And I hope, uh, you, know, um, you know, as we, as we get more and more input from people, we'll come back to you and, uh, and, and keep asking for more advice. Thank you. Thanks for thank joining. You. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.